I want to talk about Tara Brock. She got me going on this whole thing. It was actually a client of mine told me about her and kept telling me, kept saying, haven't you, you know, listened to Tara Brock's webcast? And I'm, you know, I've got so many things on my plate. I'm like, no, I haven't got to that yet. And so when I finally did it, I was like, oh my gosh, she has just opened up this whole world of wonderful. I love what she does. Anyway, so she's a clinical psychologist and a Buddhist teacher. She combines both in both practices in what she calls Buddhist psychology and trains others in meditation and psychotherapy. So she's actually working with clients and also training other professionals. And she integrates this mindfulness in her clinical practice. And she knows that there's quite a bit of mindful research out there. And it is. It's all over the place from health care to prison reform. It, basically, one of the things that is happening and the thing that they're able to research is what's going on in the brain and the nervous system when people use these meditative practices. So what will happen is it activates the prefrontal cortex and deactivates the limbic system. So they're able to see that um, physiologically is changing. So if to you know, understand how that works, basically it pr improves your concentration because that's the part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex is doing the problem solving. So if that's where the blood's flowing to and that's where the energy's going, then you're able to concentrate, do the problem solving. And where the limbic system has all the emotional stuff going on in it, it allows that system to calm down so that you've got a tolerance of the emotions and pain as well. They've done some research with like pain management and <laughs> mindfulness. Um, it does generally reduce anxiety and biological stress and emotional stress, so it's an awesome thing. Tara Brock was trained by Jack Kornfield, and both of these masters of meditation were trained through Vipassana. It's also pronounced Vipassana. I learned about Vipassana from my brother Scott several years ago. He actually embarked on the training and learned a lot. Uh, it's a very difficult training. So there's a full-length movie called Doing Time, Doing Vipassana, and it's very worthwhile to just download it. I, I watched it for free. I think you can buy it, and it's great because it'll contribute to this great effort. But what they're doing is they're able to use meditation in the prison system. It started in India with one of the worst prisons in the world. And they'd had it there before, and I guess they brought it back in the 80s or something. And they found so much of a drastic change in the inmates that it became a worldwide thing. It was like, it just took off. And they do have it in our prisons here in the US, some of them. To describe what happens in the Vipassana meditation, what they will do is just be in silence for days. And so the first day, it's usually just uncomfortable. The first few days, it's very uncomfortable. People are just going crazy with what's going on in their head. It's just a challenge to try to, to just stay still and silent. And, and you are just supposed to stay in a, in a meditative position and breathe. And that's all you do. And it's, I, I look at it and think, I don't think I could do it. But the people who are doing it, I mean, think about it. If you're, if you're in prison, I could probably do it there. And so I just cross my fingers that that's not where I end up because I have to learn it or something. Because <laughs> but I, see, I do see actually miracles happen. With, with I worked in some jails and stuff, and it is amazing to see. But, you know, if I had all the, that, that's all I had to do with my time, maybe. But it would still be uncomfortable. Anyway, what they find is that over time, over a few days, you start to just be in touch with your body. So you start to just be aware of, you go into the mindfulness, basically. And then as, as you kind of move into that, then it's like, it's just amazing how it'll just change the person and um, their personalities change. I mean, all kinds of things will change. But they start to recognize that it's all within them. If they're going to change their life or whatever, they, it's all within them. So in the, the movie, Doing Time, Doing Vipassana, it's amazing to see they kind of show what happens as, the, as these inmates come out from the practice. I, it might have been 10 days or something. Um, you know, they just take bathroom breaks and eating breaks, and that's it. And they're silent and in the pose the rest of the time. But they came out, and they embraced guards. I mean, it was just absolutely amazing how they, you could just see them being a changed person. There are some incredible benefits of this type of meditation process and a retreat of this nature. If you are interested in it, they offer 10-day courses as close as Idaho and several places around the nation. You can find out more about them at dhamma.org, D-H-A-M-M-A.org. Well, that is a kind of meditation that we're not all ready for. So we're going to talk about some things we might be ready for. 
the thing I found is a lot of us have a false refuge. It's very common. Those often come from trying to cover our woundedness, the pain or the discomfort we're experiencing. Common themes are busyness, being so busy you can't really slow down, stop, and experience what you are feeling inside. Addictive behaviors is an obvious one. Sleep, I guess they call it in India, the poor man's nirvana. Sleep. Medication, that's another one. And perfectionism, along the lines of busyness. But just be aware, if you have one of these kinds of things going on in your life, it's probably a false refuge. That term does come from Tara Brock, and she also talks about the trauma response. When we talked about the dog, he's the one who's in that state of blissful peace. Animals don't get trauma. If you think about it, they are living in a world of life or death, much more than we are, most of the time, but they don't experience trauma. They shake it off. And actually, literally, they shake it off. Humans are the ones who experience the trauma. And it's because of this frontal cortex. Because we anticipate more trauma. So we're living in this world where trauma happens, it'll come back. Or you replay the incident to where you're looping. And just reliving the trauma. So we're living in the past. What happens sometimes with people who've experienced trauma is that their false refuge becomes dissociation. What dissociation is, is basically cutting yourself off from the present moment. I've worked with people with trauma lately. I took the EMDR training years ago, and I've used this technique. I love it. It's one of the best things I've found for really changing what's going on in the brain when someone's traumatized. And it involves eye movement and desensitization of the triggers and reprocessing the events. I just recently took the second level of the training where we learn how to work with people who dissociate. And I've had this happen since then. And it's kind of unsettling when I'm working with someone and we're going into some heavy stuff and all of a sudden they say, um, I'm not here anymore. <laughs> I'm over here. <laughs> I can't deal with it. Sometimes people will actually step out of their body or mentally remove themselves completely from the situation. But there is a solution. The solution is to stop running and leaving. Okay, so the, so the solution is to stop running from whatever it is to create a new neural pathway which involves increasing the tolerance of negative emotions with an added resource. And that is a real refuge. And so I'll repeat what you said. So, or Dr. Oz has said that what really supports the vagus nerve so, and that's like the central nerve that really, like the, the backbone of our nervous system, is prayer and meditation. That's the kind of thing, and so neurologically, if that's really it, that's really, it really is. It's to find a sacred presence. And so that real refuge is, it's whatever the person, you know, individually we find as that sacred presence. It might just be a sense of loving safety, but we might be accessing a higher vibration. And so um, if you're new to that term, the higher vibration I'm, I'm speaking of is, is kind of, there's frequencies. So we're, there's all these different frequencies. When we're stuck in something very painful and traumatic, it's a low frequency. So sometimes we have to act something, access something outside of ourself that's at a higher frequency to kind of pull us up. That might be a higher self, it might be angels, uh, might be a divine presence. And, you know, for, for people who have, you know, are Christian, it might be, Christ, it might be, you know, their sense of who God is, and it could be a trusted therapist or a support system with these individuals in it, but whatever that is, that's what's got to be developed first and strengthened, and you got to build on that and really strengthen that experience of safety, and you can use sensory enhancement, so that's the actually the first phase of EMDR is the first session, you're just building that support, you're building that sense of what is very safe and creating a whole lot of sensory enhancement or mindfulness with that. And there's also some things you can do, you know, individually we can just try that will phys physically calm the parasympathetic nervous system. So touch is one of those things. So like when you give somebody a hug, that's what you're doing. You're calming their parasympathetic nervous system. Um, you can put your hand on your heart and just try that for a minute. It's just... It is interesting, it's like, it just kind of brings down your energy a little bit. 
and brain gym. Yep. And put your fingertips together, yeah? Oh, that's uncomfortable to me, but everybody's different, so you gotta find your thing. <laughs> and animals, yeah, pets. Actually, pets should be in there, yep. Um, the other thing is tapping. And so raise your hand if you're familiar with EFT. It's, okay, most, yeah. Um, that's another technique I've used. As I was doing the EMDR with someone and they started to go away and just, I lost them. That's the thing we did to bring this client back was just start the tapping and not use any of the, you know, the cognitive stuff that goes with it, but just tap. And so just tapping through that system seemed to bring that person back to presence and to calm the, parasympathetic nervous system um, just the tapping because you're you're more getting in touch with just your body with that the idea is to find some way to move through the pain rather than away from it in my own experiences that I get what that is through and through my experience it was um, you know as a Christian I got really in touch with um, the Savior as I was going through something really hard and I could see myself what it was that I felt I was doing was putting up my defenses because I wanted to shield myself and so rather than dissociate that's kind of my coping mechanism is to just shield and I felt really prompted it was like smack in the middle of this phone call with actually my ex-husband's girlfriend about my children and so obviously there's you know a lot of room for triggers there and smack at the middle of this phone call, I called on that source and said, okay, let me, you know, go through this somehow different, do something different. Because I knew that if I got reactive and defensive, it would make it worse. What I experienced was instead of feeling like I had a shield up in front of me and the arrows that she was sending at me were just bouncing off of it, it was like I took the shield down and I trusted enough to let them go through me and pierce me. And as I allowed that to happen, it was like there was this, I don't know how to explain it, but I've experienced it a few times. It's, it's almost palpable, but it's like this cushion of light, of, of just spirit. And it was like that was there with the arrows. So it was like the arrows went through me, but it was different than me feeling them alone. What... I got from that was I can go through it. I can go through the pain. The pain can go through me. And with this source, I can, I'll be okay. And, and it ended up turning at that moment, everything turned around in the conversation. And she and I became friends for the first time in this whole process. And from that point on, things worked out with the kids, things worked out with the ex. It was just, it was a pivotal moment. And um, so I think it's absolutely critical. So let me tell you another little story of this. Um, Tara Brock tells a story of Diane. And Diane was dissociating. She was, you know, she'd had a horrible childhood, learned this dissociation technique at age seven, and was now trying to pull her life back together and deal with um, what had happened to her in her childhood. But she was, you know, she'd been working with, you know, Tara for quite a while. and came back to a session once where she said, I, I went through some stuff, and this is what I went through. She was alone and she had a frightening memory, and rather than avoid it or resort to an unproductive coping mechanism, she decided to stay with the pain and discomfort. She felt some intense pain. She felt, you know, she was shaken by it. She felt torn apart by this pain, but kept calling on her loving presence, her sacred presence. And the more she stayed with it, she says, the more I became the loving presence. I realized that is who I am. That's the trick. And, it, and this is the gift. And this is the gift in those who have experienced this kind of stuff in their life is that they find that connection more than anybody else has to. They, it's like they have to and, or they get to. And, and it's amazing when you find that. The technique I have used when I find someone is dissociating or is kind of trying to find that calming, you know, if they're agitated or whatever. The best thing I found is that it's, it's a light stream meditation. So we'll go through it. 